Let's pray, okay? So, Father, we just thank you and praise you for each beautiful soul in this room. I thank you most especially, though, Lord, for the souls that they're carrying in their heart. The people that they're walking in with, the the lost, the prodigals in their lives. And Jesus, that you would just come. And Mama Mary, would you wrap your mantle around them? And St. Joseph, would you come be just a sturdy shelter for them? We entrust these prodigals. We entrust these beautiful sons and daughters to you. For they are yours. Whether they know it or not. We just release them to you. And we we release any burden, any, any exhaustion, any heaviness of feeling like we've had to carry them. Jesus, you promised that we could cast our cares upon you because you care for us. I don't like necessarily the image of flinging people at Jesus, but I do like the image of of handing them over. And even maybe in, in some ways, the way that the image of the Pieta with Mary holding Jesus, that Mary would hold each son, each daughter, each grandchild, each friend, each neighbor, whomever it is, that you are either having us accompany or you're calling someone else to accompany into your kingdom. Jesus, we love you. We trust in you. We trust in you. We trust in you. And we ask this in your precious and holy name. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. So we're going to talk about accompaniment today. And if you've been in the church lately and you pay attention a little bit, you probably heard that word, right? And I think you can hear it go one of two ways. You can hear it go in the way of Jesus, or you can hear it go in the way of we're just nice people. And I think that's the danger that we can fall into with accompaniment. It was just, we're just nice people, and we're going to be nice to them. We're going to love them. But we never really introduce them to Jesus. And the accompaniment I want to talk about today, and the accompaniment that I think that Pope Francis and the church is asking of us is one that's focused on and centered around the person of Jesus Christ. Or that he's actually, and we'll talk about this in a minute when we talk about accompaniment in scriptures, he's the one that's walking with him, we're just walking alongside. And we have to have that, I feel like, imagery and conviction in our hearts. So let's talk a little bit about what accompaniment is. And um, those of you, I have some friends here from Encounter, so they know me. Yes, 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 couple Encounter friends. Um, So they know I am an English major. Uh, My undergrad was in English. So I love a good word. As I said before, I love Hebrew. I love all of it. But words have power and they matter. So I always like to actually understand what a word means, not just what I think it means. So I looked up the word accompaniment. And I love that there's some definitions that even the dictionary gives us that helps us understand more fully what accompaniment can look like. And so there's in reference to some different styles of accompaniment. The first is this, accompaniment in music, to support with an instrument or voice a solo artist. This is probably one of my favorites. See, the father is singing a song of love over them, directly to them. He is the solo artist. Jesus is the solo artist. We merely play in the background. We play something that supports, maybe adds some beauty, some some depth to But Jesus is singing, and he's the solo artist. So anywhere along the lines where we felt like, and this can happen, where we felt like our accompaniment or our walking with someone has turned to us feeling the pressure of needing to be the Savior (laughs) or their Savior, (laughs) like there's only one hero in this story, and it's not us. That's very comforting (laughs) and I hope freeing. But when you start to walk with people and you love them and your heart burns for them and you begin to experience the thirst, perhaps in a small way that Jesus experienced on the cross for them, you can get a little overwhelmed and a little over-involved or over-invested, right? And Jesus is like, pull back. They're mine. I'm the solo. We just support. So I love keeping that in my mind, right? Um, that we support with an instrument or a voice, a solo artist, Jesus I love this too. I'm a foodie. If you see my Instagram, it's a lot about food. 
but I contend Jesus ate a lot of meals, so it works out well. But in food, accompaniment complements or adds balance to. Right? You're not the main dish, again. You're complementing or bringing a little balance to the meal that the Lord is, the banquet the Lord is setting before them. In people, it literally means to go with, right? And those of you who've done this or experienced this, you'll know this. And a synonym for it is companion, right? That we're companions on this journey of life, this journey that heads us back home to the Father. There's a couple of things I think that um, we can differentiate. So there's accompaniment in two ways that I see it. Accompaniment, like how many of you have ever done like street evangelization? Meaning like you've gone out on the streets, you've told people about Jesus, you've told them about I love, you've knocked on some door, you've done whatever. You're like, are you Catholic, Sarah? Yes, I am. It's a thing. <laughs> you can do it. A few of you. So like what I think is so amazing about those experiences is someone could actually hear that Jesus loves them for the very first time. If the simplicity of your message is, hey, I just feel like I wanted to let you know, I don't know if anyone's ever told you, Jesus really loves you. It's actually a really powerful way to begin a witness to somebody. You don't have to have super special gifts. You don't have to know the whole gospel, but just to open that door. The thing is, is like after that door is open, they're probably going to need somebody to walk with them. Like if they're like, whoa, or the Holy Spirit convicts their heart, or the Holy Spirit had been tilling their heart, waiting for you to drop that seed of truth, they're probably going to need somebody to walk with them. Or maybe you get a word of knowledge, or you pray with them, and God does something amazing, and they're like, whoa, God is real. I want to follow him. They don't come out just ready to go, right? They need someone to walk with him. But then I think there's a second kind of accompaniment. And like the way I differentiate these and the way that I think it's helpful to think of them in my mind is this, the microwave and the slow cooker, (laughs) right? Like you've met people where it's like the Holy Spirit just gives you the code. You punch it in and they're like, boom, I'm cooked. I am, I am in like, and you, you know, you hear stories of this, right? Of people who have that encounter, something is unlocked in their heart. They say, yes, Jesus comes in and they are on fire. They're ready to go. They're like a hot pocket lava, just ready, oozing with Jesus, right? But then there's other people that you talk to them, and just because of like this, their, their story, the things they've walked through, the distortions they have about God, the things that they think they know but really don't about him, it may take a little longer. So they may be your low and slow, but they need somebody to walk with them too. Right? Like they, they need someone to walk alongside them. I think the challenge is, is like we want, we, like if you're like in America, <laughs> you want the microwave all the time. Like wouldn't that be nice? If you're like, just Jesus, just give me, I will do it. Just tell me whatever you want to say. And sometimes he does when we ask, what do you want me to say to this person? Particularly when we step out and take a risk, I feel like he shows up big time for us, Right? But um, even though there's that desire for us, how many of you have experienced the slow cooker in your life? Yeah, right? You've been walking with somebody and you're walking with somebody and you're walking with somebody. My friend that I was talking about this morning, that took like a couple of years, right, of walking. And then he kind of had to hit his own rock bottom, right, for him to really come to the end of himself. But the reality is at some point, like when I talked about this morning with the prodigal, at some point the famine comes, And the choice is, do we say yes? Do we say yes to the Lord? Do we come back? Do we respond to him? Or do we wait for the next famine? It always comes. And so if we're there with them, we will be there with them to walk them back to the Father, to introduce them to the Father, to to bring to them what they need. But I love some of the things that the church says, or particularly Pope Francis says in Evangelium Gaudium about accompaniment. This one I love. And he says this, spiritual accompaniment must lead others ever closer to God. To accompany them would be counterproductive if it became a sort of therapy supporting their self-absorption and ceased to be a pilgrimage with Christ to the Father. Do you see the difference there? A pilgrimage with Christ to the Father. Here's the tough part because we are all really nice people in this room, 
I can tell. I mean, just look at you. You're lovely. I'm sure you're just so kind. Sometimes we will just wait and wait and wait and wait and wait and wait and wait to talk about Jesus. And we listen and we listen and we listen and we do all this like great stuff, but we never get to Jesus. And that's where I think accompaniment can go off the rails. But what he's saying is, is it can be counterproductive if we don't lead them closer to Jesus and we let them just continue to sit in their stuff. You can sit with them in their stuff, but we can't stay there, right? Genuine spiritual accompaniment always begins and flourishes in the context of service to the mission of evangelization. This is the context in which we're doing it. Um, I like this. The one who accompanies is like a midwife, helping us to come to life, to live more fully. But the accompanier receives life also. And as people open up to each other, a communion of hearts develops between them. They do not clutch on to each other, but give life to one another to call each other to greater freedom. Right? This is a gift, not only to the person that we're walking through, like walking through life with, but to us too. You get life. What's more exciting than seeing someone come alive with the love of Jesus? Doesn't it just build your faith? When you have a testimony or you hear someone share their testimony and they're like, this is what God did for me, doesn't it just light you back up again? It's like it takes the coals of your heart, puts it back in the fire, and then puts it back in your furnace, and you are ready. So this isn't just like a gift of ourself. It's a gift to us as well. And I love this. They do not clutch on to each other, right? We don't need their affirmation. We don't need their love. We don't need their voice to define how good or valuable we are because whose voice is defining us, right? We don't want it to become codependent, (laughs) Like where we need them to need us. It's his voice that defines us. So anything that happens, anything that we walk through with them, that's them and Jesus. And we love them and we support them, but it doesn't define us. It doesn't give us value. We want to be careful not to clutch too tightly, right? Not to hold too tightly. And for you mamas out there, you're like, St. Augustine, St. Monica, don't tell me that, Sarah. She chased him all the way. To that. I'm like, yes, but she also had a bishop named St. Ambrose who said, girl, you got to let go a little. You got to give him some space. I'm walking with him. I'm working with him. And she did. She had to back off a little bit. Doesn't mean she stopped praying, but she maybe wasn't like on his tail like all the time. But one of my favorite examples I feel like in the church, and I may just be partial to him because he's my guy, but St. John Paul II, I think is a master of accompaniment. You want to look at somebody who did this really, really, really well in the modern world? Look at JP2 and the life that he lived. Not just when he became Pope, but when he was Father Carol Watia. There's a, a, a biography about him that I love, and one of the quotes that I'm going to read to you from there I think is just beautiful. It says, Father Watia was a master of accompaniment, walking with people amid their daily joys and struggles and witnessing Christ's love to them. He said that God called him to live with people everywhere to be with them in everything but sin. There's the line in the sand. There's the line we have to be mindful of. That's what we have to see. To live with them, to be with them everywhere, to have life with them in everything but sin. That's where I just can't go with you. It said that he... um, of of one of the friends, these young adults that he walked with, this is what he said. We felt that we could discuss anything with him. We could talk about absolutely anything. Another young person said he had mastered the art of listening, that he was always interested and always had time. Another simply said he lived our problems. Such a beautiful witness, right, to what it is And a man who, if you ever, did any of you ever get to hear him speak or be anywhere in the general vicinity of him? When he spoke from the stage, there could be millions of people. Did you not just feel so loved? Like he was speaking directly to you. That's a man who carries the heart of the father, in my opinion. What I encountered when I met JP2 at like a World Youth Day, five million people back, (laughs) was someone who loved me, who knew me, 
who spoke the truth to me, but he did it with the heart of the Father. And I think that's a witness to us as we walk with people in accompaniment. And I love this last little bit on Father Watia or Pope John Paul II. They said this, after years of serving as a priest and investing deeply in these young adults, Father Watia eventually became a bishop, then a cardinal, and then later he was elected pope. Many of his friends wondered if this new responsibility would destroy their friendship. One of them lamented, we've lost him. Only a little while later, however, they found themselves in possession of invitations to the Vatican. Each year, even with his torturous schedule as pope, he made time for them in Rome. And just hours before he died, he sent one last message to those same old friends. It just wrecks me. I don't know why it does, but like the commitment of that, like that's a slow cooker friendship, right? And to think of, even on the deathbed, to think of them, that they would feel so known, so seen, so loved, so walked with. I think he's such a beautiful example for us of what it looks like to accompany people. But I think scripture gives us great example of what accompaniment looks like. And there's no other master greater than Jesus, right? In the way that he walked with people. But there's two particular scriptures I want to highlight um, when we're talking about accompaniment. And the first one might be a surprise. I'm a, I'm a fan of Paul. You might remember from this morning. But in 1 Thessalonians, Thessalonians 2.8, he said this. So be affectionately desirous so affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. To me, this is a great, just tiny little scripture of like, you, I, our, our hearts were filled with compassion and love with you. So not just that we shared the gospel with you, which is a great gift in and of itself, but that we'd share our very selves with you. Jesus is the standard and Paul is the pattern. Here's a great example of that. Yeah, that he was so affectionately desirous. Are you affectionately desirous of the lost? Do you want to share the gospel with them, but do you also want to share your lives? Do you want to, will you, are you willing to give them your very life as well? It's a high call, but to follow Jesus is, right? There is a cost to discipleship. It will cost us, but it never, ever outweighs what we receive. It's worth it. But the one that I think I really, really love is a beautiful example. And one that I would encourage you when you go home to meditate on more is the story of the road to Emmaus. Some, some road to Emmaus fans out here? Yeah, okay, a couple people, a couple people. I think there's so much richness. I'm gonna pull out some things, some practical things that Jesus shows us in walking in the road to Emmaus. But spend time with the Holy Spirit when you go home. One of the things that I love about workshops and keynotes and all the things at these conferences is they're inspiring. They encourage you. They're like, yes, I'm going to do it. And then you go home and then you're like, I'm going to do it. (laughs) And two weeks later, you're like, "Ah, I'm tired. I don't remember. (laughs) Right? But these, the word of God is alive and active, Right? So when you go home and you study the scriptures that were talked about, it will bring back memories. It'll bring back experiences and it'll bring back conviction. So hold on to the scriptures. Everything that like people gave you this weekend, treasure them, revisit them, spend the next few weeks in them. You'll never get tired of them, I promise. There's always something new. But on the road to Emmaus, I'm going to read to you, and I know this is dangerous. If someone snores, just give them an elbow. We will make it. Now, on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all the things that had happened. Well, they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? I'm like, what a funny question. You are talking to Jesus, friend. <laughs> He's like, are you the only? He probably felt real bad. Anyways, <laughs> moving on. He asked them, what things? Don't you love Jesus? Like master of rhetorical questions. Always answered these questions like, let me make you think. 
answered a question with a question, right? Here we are, question with a question. He's like, Let me, I'm not just going to drop truth on you, because he could have. He definitely had earned it at that point, for sure. But he answers a question with a question, right? I love that. He said, what things? They replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that it was the one to redeem Israel. I love that. They lost hope. A lot of people were going to walk with. We had hoped. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. I love this. You, are, you, you had been a part of all of what was happening. You were questioning. You were hopeless. You were there was angels that came and told you that, you were, that Jesus is alive, but here you are walking away, sad. What more do you need? Anyways, some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women, tr- women are trustworthy, just as the women had said, <laughs> but they did not see him. Then he said to them, oh, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets had declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. What humility. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly saying, stay with us. Because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from sight. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour, they got up and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the 11 and their companions gathered together. They were saying, the Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told him what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. Here's some things I think that are helpful to remember about this scripture that teach us about accompaniment in the way of Jesus. Number one, yes, he asks, he like asks questions with questions or responds to questions with questions. He, he prods them, he searches them, he tries to evoke the truth that's already in them, not just tell them what they need to know or tell them the truth. He's patient, he's humble. Here's what I love about the story that not, maybe not everybody knows either. They were going the wrong way. Did you ever think about that? Everything in the scriptures are centering around what happened in Jerusalem, the Last Supper, the cross, the resurrection, the sending of the Holy Spirit. They're going the opposite way. In some ways, I like to think like perhaps they were so sad and had lost such hope that they were literally just going back to the lives that they led before, perhaps to where they had come from originally. But what I love is Jesus walks with them even though they're going the wrong way? Could he have yanked their shoulders and said, hey, we're going back, we're going this way. What are you doing? But for a little while, he walks with them in the wrong direction. I think sometimes that's what accompaniment looks like. We're going to be walking and we're going to be like, what are we doing? (laughs) And you could tell, have you ever had that experience of like, someone's telling you you're going the wrong way? Like you're driving the car and you got a backseat driver. And like, you're going the wrong way. And you're like, no, I'm not. And then you realize, and you're like, something like a sign or something real or actual around you, and you're like, ooh, I might have, perchance, gone the wrong way. But you, they had to have an experiential knowledge themselves. Right, if the person in the seat next to them just rips the steering wheel and like turn, pulls a Yui and turns them around, it's not gonna be a good experience. They're not gonna feel freedom. In the same way, Jesus is like, okay, we're gonna, I'm going to walk with you. And for some of us, that might feel a little bit uncomfortable, but what did we talk about this morning? What did Jesus' dinner table look like? 
It's full of all the unworthy, all the unclean, all the sinners, all the people that the religious or those around them would have said, not worthy. Shouldn't be sitting at that table with Jesus if you really are the son of God. We have to be convinced. If you're going to do this work of accompaniment, you have to be convinced that the light within you is stronger than any darkness you will walk through. You have the light of the world living inside of you. Amen? Amen. Do you believe that? Is that light stronger than any darkness? So everywhere you go, where does that light go? With you. You have to be convinced. You cannot look, in the dark, look at the darkness and try to say, measure it out. It's like, no, Jesus, the light of the world, the King of kings is inside of me. What shall I fear? I'm not asking you to be stupid, be prudent, be wise, use the Holy Spirit, right? But you have to be convicted of that truth, that the light that you carry is brighter than any darkness when we go to meet people where they are. Um, He listened to them. He didn't begin by teaching. He didn't begin by explaining. Are you a good listener? When I worked with Alpha, we used to do this like little um, activity and I'd tell people to go home and try it out in their like real lives and their families at their works. I'm like, what I want you to do is I want you just to listen to everybody around you like all day for one day. And all you're supposed to do is say things like, that's interesting, tell me more. Or like, I've never really heard about That's fascinating. Tell me more. Or ask some more questions and do a lot of listening. You will be fascinated at what it does in your relationships. We as a culture are quick to speak and slow to listen, right? But when you start listening, you will hear them, but you will also, I believe, hear the Holy Spirit speaking about them. Because you're not so busy trying to think of like, what should I say in response? I love apologetics. Please hear me. Go be an apologist if that's what the Lord has on your life. But do a lot of listening. I'm, I was walking, I've been walking with a woman for a long time who actually came through an alpha. And we, um, you know, the pandemic's been hard on people. Amen. We had our first dinner together and she had been, um, she'd been watching the History Channel. So she's trying to tell me all these really fun things about Jesus that are not true. And so... I had to do a lot of listening and what I call internal clenching, like what I was doing up there, where you smile and you're like, <laughs> what? yeah, that's so interesting. Um, and I, I caught myself. I caught myself in that moment where she was saying some things and I was starting to get a little, you know, you can feel the heat rising. And, and, I, and I almost said something back and I realized I was listening to respond, not listening to hear right? Formulating my response to what they were saying. Helpful? No. And when I'm so busy formulating my response, I can't hear Holy Spirit trying to tell me about what's really going on. And what's really going on, and when we finally got there, is I finally just had to say, you seem kind of angry about this. What is going on? And then she was able to say, well, if this is true and this is true and this is true, this explains so much of what happened in my life. And I was like, okay, I get it now. There's a place of deep pain that this is feeling like it's helping you justify to help you understand. I get that. And if I just try to rip it out of her hands, it's not going to go well. But in listening and helping break down and having, being able to hear the wound, the, the thing that was actually driving the intensity of the conversation instead of just matching her with intensity, I was able to speak truth and life and bring a balm through the Holy Spirit of healing to that place inside of her. But if I had bulldozed, if I had just listened to respond, I would have missed that moment. I would have missed that opportunity to invite Jesus in to bring the healing that she needed. I love this. And this is a key for us Catholics because um, sometimes we get this bad rap about not using scripture enough, which is false. But he opened the scriptures for him. Like Jesus opened the scriptures for them and helped them make sense of their experience in the larger plan that God had. When we're walking with people, opening the scriptures to them, using the scriptures is powerful. We can't avoid inviting them into scripture. We can't avoid helping them see themselves in this larger story that God's writing. 
But you don't have to quote verse in citation and give them the address. You're like, well, did you know in 1 Thessalonians 2, verses 14 through 17, the Lord saith to you, not the way, (laughs) but I have found that when you know the scriptures well enough, when you spend time and abide with the Lord in the scriptures, they become like real stories for you. And you can tell them like a story. And I was walking with another young man who's been um, struggling with addiction and he'd come basically to say, like, I'm just a mess. I don't know what to do. I can't figure it out. So I told him the story of the prodigal son without telling him it was a story. And from the Bible. And he was like, that's me. That's where I'm at. That's what I need. I'm like, cool, because that's God the Father. And that's what he wants to do in your life. He was like, okay. I'm like, can we pray? And he's like, yeah. <laughs> But I didn't have to get out the, you know, I didn't have to get out the Bible. I didn't have, there will come a time for that, right? When you learn, when you teach them then to seek his voice there in, in his word. But you can do that in a way that's very unassuming. Okay, so I want to move into some practicalities of accompaniment because I'm mindful of time and everybody loves a good practical, right? So I'm going to break it down for you in two ways. The microwave and the slow cooker. We've talked about before. So I'm telling you the microwave because I believe I believe that there are people in this room that the Lord is stirring. And there are people in this room who the Lord would give words to if they were bold and they stepped out in their everyday lives to share the love of Jesus. So I believe there are going to be a lot more people in this room who need the microwave version of accompaniment because they just met somebody and they spoke the love of Jesus to them and they responded. And now they want to know what comes next. I believe there are people in this room who are like, I could never do that. And the Lord is saying, yes, you can. I'm just going to leave that, drop that nugget for you to discern with the Lord. But after a powerful moment of encounter, let's say you pray for someone and they get healed. It happens. You pray and the Lord gives you a word about them or a word of encouragement or something about them that they're like, how could you know that? And I'm like, I don't know that. But the one who knows everything, the one who made you and loves you knows it all. And he knows you and he loves you and he sees you. Guys, the gifts aren't used for show, right? That's not the reason. It's not to like go do fun showy things and talk about the testimonies later. The gifts are to draw people back to him. That's the purpose. So if you have one of those moments, my suggestion to you would be Become so desirous of them that you'd share even yourself with them. And obviously you can't do that with everybody. Let's say you meet like 20 people. If you get real, if you get real excited and you leave this place and at dinner, you're like telling everybody about Jesus and you've got like 20 people, like that may not be possible, but may not be possible to follow up with every single one of them. But if the Lord highlights someone, if they give, if he gives you a heart, if you're filled with compassion with someone, ask for their email. Follow up with them. Send them something. Encourage them. I would love to tell you that um, I'm one of those people who naturally always is like hearing the Holy Spirit when I need to check in on somebody I'm walking with. Sometimes I have to automate it where I put a little reminder in my phone, follow up with so-and-so, and it sends me a little notification. So then I pause, I pray. and it's like, Lord, what do you want me to say? What scripture verse do you want me to send? What do you want me to do? I mean, I know that sounds maybe less spiritual than people would like, but it's real. (laughs) Because if you're really busy and you're doing life, it's a really practical way of like, oh, this is how I'm going to follow up with somebody I just met. I'm literally going to make an appointment in my calendar from a week from now to reach out, to check in, to see how they're doing. Don't overlook the practicals that God wants to use uh, to help you do that. So ask them questions. Find out what they need to help discern like what's the next step for them. Maybe they've just been away from church. I met somebody, we engaged with her at her front door and invited her to come back to mass because she'd been away from church. Because you know, you kind of start with like all sorts of things. And then she's like, oh, I actually grew up Catholic. I'm like, awesome. Do you know you're still Catholic? (laughs) And there's this really cool church down the street for you that would love to welcome you back. And the gift of like being able to come uh, to, to discern like where they are. Do they need, is there like a local church that you can connect them to? Is there something else um, that would be a good resource, a good follow-up? You know, obviously I'm a big Alpha fan, so I'm going to push Alpha. But like, <laughs> like something that's like a big beginner's open door 
to what's the next step for them. Um, and be obedient to the Holy Spirit. So if the Lord prompts you, follow. If he gives you something for them, be bold. Share it with them. If the Lord invites you to do something, do it. And you will see. One of my favorite stories, there's this guy named, does anybody know of a guy named Robbie Dawkins? He's like a Protestant pastor. Oh, we got a Robbie Dawkins. Girl, we'll talk later. You guys know. Okay. He tells a story of this woman who was trying to follow the Holy Spirit for the first time in her life. And she was just like, I'll do whatever you ask, Lord. Pray that prayer. (laughs) He goes, I want you to go inside that gas station and I want you to stand on your head. And she was like, there is no way that is the Lord. But it just kept getting stronger and stronger. She went in that gas station and she stood on her head. And the cashier behind the register burst into tears. And she's like, what happened? (laughs) And the cashier said, I had just been telling God that the only way I'm going to believe, the only way I'm going to know that you're real is if he sends somebody in this store and they stand on their head in front of me. (laughs) Moral of the story, friends your obedience could save someone's life. We don't know what people are walking through. But what does a slow cooker like, look like? Here's a big one. Some of you are like probably really good at this. I have a feeling in this room, number one is like, check. Begin with intercession, prayer, and fasting. If you're walking with somebody, if you are like really desirous of them to know the Lord, pray and fast. I love you. Say, Sarah loves me. Yeah, okay, good. We have to rediscover the power of prayer and fasting in the church. And the prayer and fasting, yes, of course, like it does it move God's heart 100%. But what I think the prayer and fasting does, I think it builds our faith. I think it refines us, it purifies us. Like it helps us in this work of evangelization that we all want to do. So don't be afraid to travail in prayer for somebody. Does anybody know what that means, travailing prayer? That's like the like, cry, like crying out from the depths of your heart for somebody, standing in the gap in a powerful way. Don't diminish the prayer and the fasting. Number two, uh, as much as possible, seek to create an authentic friendship with people in your circle of influence. Meaning, here's the low-hanging fruit in your life, the people around you the people you work with, the people you pass every day on the way to work, the people you pass every day in the coffee shop. These are your low-hanging fruits. These are the people that he might be inviting you into. Create just a friendship with first. Maybe just be friends. Like C.S. Lewis said, like that moment of friendship begins when it's like, oh, you as well. I thought I was the only one having those moments with people. Let them be authentic. Be interested in people. (laughs) Create real relationships with them and allow the Lord to speak. Listen, be curious, and be contemplative. Contemplate the person in front of you. Jesus did this. But contemplate what the Father is saying at the same time about them. Like, Father, what do you want them to know? What are you saying? What do you see? Ask the Lord questions. Be like Jesus in this way. Be generous. This may sound like a a simple, obvious one, but Christians, we should be the most generous people group on this planet. In a lot of ways, we really are. Like we support hospitals, orphanages. I mean, there's no greater legacy, I think, than the Catholic Church in terms of the way that we care for the poor. But in the daily interactions with people, tip more than you need to. When you tell them God loves them, show them God loves them, if you can. Really go out of your way to be generous with your time, with your talent, with your treasure. Um, Look for moments to share your testimony in the regular rhythms of life. Some people have developed like your little um, elevator pitch, your 30-second testimony. Awesome. Great. But I think when you're really walking with people slowly, what a beautiful testimony it is when they say, hey, how did you navigate this with your kid? 
It's an opportunity to say, like, well, you know, actually, it was really hard for me and my husband. But then we started to pray. And we asked God to show us how to make decisions about what our children will do or not do or whatever. Like you weave it into the normal at like rhythms of your life. You're not forcing on them. They've asked you the question. They've given you permission. And let them be curious. And let them ask you more questions. And when they're ready, to tell them the truth of the gospel. To let them know that the fruits of your life are the fruits that he wants to bear in their lives as well. And don't worry about the people who won't like you. Don't worry about the people who won't respond well to you. Don't worry about the people who may not agree with you. You keep bearing fruit. And if the only way they receive it is because they're pecking at it, let them peck. They're still getting the fruit one way or the other. And to continue to walk with them as they grow. Make space for encounter. Walk with them. Invite them to shallow entry points in your life. And you will see God do incredible things. We have to be convicted that he is even more desirous of them coming to know him than we are. Amen? Okay. I want to make a little space for Q&A because we're actually running short on time. Uh, So I think there's another microphone. And if you're like, I have no questions, Sarah. I'm like, great. We can just rest in the spirit for a while. But you do probably have a question or two, maybe. And I'll do my very best. I don't know the answers, always. But I know the one who does. So we'll sort it out somehow. I think we've got one up here. Do we have a runner? I think we're sort of here. Tell me your name first, please, when you ask a question as well. Hi, my name is Sandra Tapia. Hi, Sandra. Um, you just said walk with them in the shallow, um, walk with them even in shallow entry points. Yes. Can you kinda yes, elaborate? great, great question. So shallow entry points. Sometimes someone's ready for a full-on Catholic experience. You bring them to the highest, holiest, most beautiful, rich mass, and they're like, boom, this is it. They are wondered by awe and beauty in his presence. Other people, because of stuff, may need something a little less overwhelming, right? So they may need like, just like a movie night at your church, something that's kind of low-key where they can meet people, they can see that they're friendly, they can see that they're kind, and they're a little more open to doing something, right? So creating those shallow entry points, like it's essentially like what's your front door, what's your porch for your church? Where can people just come and sit for a while? And see if you're trustworthy, if you're good, if you are who you say you are. Because a lot of people don't trust us. We're in a post-Christian culture here in the United States. If you haven't noticed that, you probably haven't been, I don't know what you've been doing. But (laughs) what's fascinating is, so what that means is like we're trying to win people back a lot of times. They've had some experience of God, probably not an experience of the real God, of the true Lord, but they've had some experience of God or church. What's interesting is like as time passes, like in the West Coast, like my friends in Portland and Seattle, they're experiencing what we call a post-atheistic culture, where they're so separated from faith now that they're literally now engaging with evangelization with people who've let, never heard the gospel, never been to a church, nothing, which is actually a lot easier. You'd be surprised. C.S. Lewis used to say, give me a pagan any day than a disenfranchised divorcee, like someone who's divorced themselves, disenfranchised with the the commitment, the covenant they walked into. So those shallow entry points allow people to come and see, oh, you're okay. Now you just, like, again, this is why we all need the Holy Spirit, amen? Because sometimes Holy Spirit says, hit the gas, they're ready. And sometimes Holy Spirit says, pump the brakes, they're not. (laughs) Right? So sometimes you, you walk them into like the most incredible mass and they're like, they're in. But sometimes they're like, their shells are so hard and they're, so, they're like, no, I know what this is. I don't want it. Right? Um, so shallow entry points. Does that help? Cool. Last, next question. My name's Dan. Um, hi, Dan. Uh, hi. Um, you kind of, kind of answer this maybe in some, in some different ways, but Like, specifically, I'm looking at relatives, especially, like, in-laws. They're surrounded by faith-filled people, but the husbands are just, they don't want anything to do with religion. 
you know, don't, yeah. don't even talk about God or anything. But yeah, maybe their spouses are. And but me looking from the outside in, or just ha you know having contact here and there with them. Any advice of? I, I mean, you know, I know there's the the prayer, but uh, any yeah. practical thing? I mean, I think praying, praying, and and really loving them well, caring for them well, being generous with them, I think is like tills the soil. Um, here's the hard thing about families. Uh, but it's also a grace, I believe. Like there's an interdependency God's created in us in the body of Christ, right? So your son or daughter or even your relative may not be brought into the kingdom by you. Maybe, but it may be not. Maybe God has somebody else they're going to put in their path. That's why I'm so committed and devoted to the work of evangelization because I may not be the person who brings my baby sister home. I pray, I try, you know, we have conversations, I love her, I listen to her, but you may be. Maybe you live in her neighborhood. Maybe she's open to you, and she'll receive an invitation from you that she wouldn't receive from me. The harvest is ripe, guys. There is no more exciting time, I believe, than right now to be following Jesus and to be inviting people into a relationship with Jesus. But if we're all doing our job... We don't have to worry about any member of our family not being brought into the kingdom because everybody's working towards the same goal. And eventually they'll get picked off by somebody. <laughs> but don't miss the opportunities that the Holy Spirit might open for you. Like there's the challenge is sometimes we, we spiritualize our fear or our nervousness. We're like, oh, I don't know if it's the right. I don't, let me pray. But I have to discern it. And you're like, actually, you just don't want to, you just don't want to talk to them. <laughs> like, you don't want to have the conversation with them, right? And the Lord's like, no, go. Because he knows their heart. And he knows what he's doing in their heart. And he knows that right moment, just like he did with that cashier, <laughs> to send one of his people in to stand on her head. Isn't that a great? You'll never forget that story, right? <laughs> if any one of you goes and stands on your head in the gas station down the street, I'll give you 20 bucks. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Only if the Lord asks, right? The, I mean, I love, there is an art to accompaniment. I like to call it the art of accompaniment. It is not a science. It is, it is completely led by the Holy Spirit. That's why I think the gift that the church needs now more than ever is real, authentic discernment with the Holy Spirit. Not just our human discernment. Yeah. Uh, you yes. I love you. I love your heart. Because I'm a type B person where I'm like, all oh, the things are great. You know, um, I, I can't answer that for you. Only the Lord can in that or your spiritual director, like someone that you're walking with. Because there's sometimes a, a desire in us to go really hard. That's not from the Lord. Right? Like where we're like, I'm going to not eat for 40 days. You know, and if that's of the Lord... God bless you, boo-boo, but if it's not, what's the fruit going to be? You may bear fruit, but there will be no seeds of life in it. Like, God's going to bless it, obviously. He, he loves you, and he honors your sacrifice. But, um, I, you know, in a lot of ways, like, to me, there's this line, you know, the line, like, obedience is greater than sacrifice in the eyes of the Lord. Be obedient to him in whatever he calls you. Make an offering, right? So it looks different for everybody. Like, I've walked with young people who are really, really passionate about fasting, but they also have come out of an eating disorder. They're not ready, right? The Lord's not asking them to fast in that way. There's another way that he's going to allow them to walk in that, but it's actually not a great place for them to step into that. So we need to honor that, right, in people's lives, their stories, their history. I think, um, though, like, there's plenty of spiritual books and things you can read on fasting, the spirituality of fasting, it's wonderful, but just ask the Lord, like, what are you, what are you asking of me? And then just do it, right? And it, it's about, there's some, like, goodness in, like, we master, right, ourselves in it. Like, we say no to ourselves. Like, no, Sarah, you cannot. <laughs> right? But there's also a, a grace in being, learning to really be obedient to God, even when it's hard, even when it's difficult. So for a newbie, you know, a little fast here or there is a big deal. And that's really a big offering for the Lord. For somebody who's been fasting for a while, you're like, I'm going to go a little more. And that's a great offering to him. So, I, I mean, the, the short answer is, like, 
really only the Lord and probably a spiritual director can help you or someone who's walking with you can help you discern like what's the Lord asking, what that looks like. But I say, ask the Lord, get a sense and go for it and give it, give it your best and receive his mercy when maybe you're not perfect in it. Yes. Sarah, I'm Sarah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Okay. Um, anyway, quick story. When you talked this morning after your talk, you said like, ask God what to do. And the host had fallen on the floor right in front of me. And I was like, oh my gosh, God literally fell to the floor, mm. burning from my heart to totally trust in him. Mm. But I also had a question, like, how do you pick yourself up? Like, I'm very good at helping others. It's really, really hard to love myself. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, there's a lot there. Um, I could do a whole other talk, but I won't. Don't worry. On loving yourself well. Uh, to care for ourselves and to work through the blocks we have to receiving the love, not only of the Lord, but of ourselves, um, you will see an exponential growth in your ability to love others when you start to see yourselves the way that he sees you, right? So like in our, like I teach at Encounter Ministries, we do, I actually teach a, one class in year two on loving yourself well. You know that like, um, that word that a lot of millennials use, like triggered? By the end of that class, everybody triggered, <laughs> They're like, oh, I'm triggered because, like, we'll ask them things. I'm like, he created your body. He loves it. Ask him what he thinks about your body, how he sees it. And then what would it look like to come into agreement with it, right? I picked body because that's always, like, a hard one for people. Um, but how, how does it look differently when we, when we like, want to love something into life instead of, like, rejecting it? disciplining it, hating it into life. That doesn't make sense. It doesn't work that way, right? So there's just different ways that I think as you learn to love your neighbor as yourself, you're highlighting a key piece that the, the Lord might also want to work in your own heart and show you how he loves you and wants you to love yourself so that when you love others, it's very free. It's not, it doesn't grasp it doesn't hold tightly. It doesn't clutch because you're like, I don't need to get any value or worth or anything from you because I know what he says about me. Does that make sense? Was that, was that helpful? Okay. Maybe one more? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Oh, you're going to get so excited for tonight. But it's a good question. So she asked, like, how do you know it's just not you? Discernment, right? But, like, that's a good point. And, I, and it's, like, nice language, but it's like, okay, what does that mean? Right? Like, what does discernment mean? Um, I think one of the, the, the ways to start very simply, and this is what I tell, like, young people even when we're beginning to learn to hear God's voice, and we're all learning. Here's what I want to tell you. You'll miss it sometimes. You're still just as loved as you were before you missed it. And there's a humility, a poverty of spirit, like Father Dave was talking about, where you say, I missed it. I'm sorry. Or like, hey, I'm still just learning. Like when it, sometimes when I'll share something with somebody, a word, you know, when you're really stepping out, I'm like, hey, I'm learning to hear God's voice. Would it be okay if I shared with you what I think he's saying? And you can tell me if that kind of makes sense to you. Right? That gives them permission that they're not saying, like, thus saith the Lord, right? That you're like, oh, I have permission to flush it if it doesn't make sense, right? And it gives us freedom to share and not saying that we're perfect or that we know exactly what. But I, I like to say, like, is it in line with his character and his nature? And is it in line with his word? Does it line up with scripture? scripture? Does it line up with his character and nature? Is it, like, encouraging, upbuilding, edifying all of the things that we read in scripture? Are great places to start discernment, Right? Like, is it in line with his word? Does it line up with his character and his nature? Is it encouraging? Is it upbuilding? Is it edifying? Those are the ways I really see the Lord speak through me to other people particularly, right? And to just be open, you know? I could be wrong, but I think this. And people are usually pretty gracious, I feel like, when you say, hey, I'm just learning. 
or I'm just starting. But those would be ways that I would, I would begin to discern. Like, because he won't say anything outside his character and his nature, and he won't say anything outside his word that doesn't line up with the word of God, because he's already spoken, right? So if we're looking for a word, start in the scriptures, and then he'll build on what he said. Amen? All right, let's pray.